Occupational Therapy. Um, my name is Rachel. Um, I'm the course director for the BSc programme here at um, St George's. Um, and I've got another one of my colleagues with me and two of our students. So I'll let them introduce themselves before we get started. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Williams. Um, I'm one of the Occupational Therapy lectures, Lecturers at City St George's University. Um, I've been in the team since May. Um, it's really nice to talk to you all. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lizzie and I'm a second year Occupational Therapy student here at St George's. Hi everyone, I'm Gregoria and I've just completed a degree. Uh, I was a student until last August, so lovely to be here with you all. Great, thank you guys. Um, so I'll start with a presentation a bit about the course um, and then we'll hear a little bit from the students um, and then there'll be time at the end for everyone to ask some questions. Just share my slides. Okay, so working, bear with me. Okay, lovely. Um, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, I think hopefully one of the others will let me know if it's not working. Um, so what we'll what I'll run through, thanks Caitlin, um, what I'll run through in this part of the webinar is a bit about occupational therapy itself, what that is um, and as a career. I'll talk a bit more specifically about the BSc programme here at St George's um, and a little bit about the entry requirements um, if that's something that you're interested in hearing about. Um, so what is occupational therapy? Um, so it's, it really is a career that's centred on people. Um, we sort of often ask if people are kind of creative, problem solvers, um, and who really enjoy helping people to get the most out of life. Um, so it's really important, I think, to be an OT, um, that you like working with people um, and that you are quite creative and enjoy really thinking outside the box um, and problem solving. So that's a really big part of what we do. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about occupations? Because I think the kind of title of occupational therapy can sometimes be confusing for people. Um, so what we mean in, in occupational therapy as occupations, um, we refer to these as the everyday activities that people do to occupy their time. So that's where the term occupations comes from. Um, and bring meaning and purpose to life. So when we talk about occupations, it can be absolutely anything that people do um, in their day to, to occupy their time. So it's kind of not just the things that people need to do. Um, so that's, you know, getting up in the morning, you know, getting washed, having a shower, eating, um, but also the people, uh, also the things that people want to be able to do and are expected to do. So whether that's, you know, expectations within families, cultures, the work environment. And these include um, kind of things like self-care, like I mentioned, so showering, eating, kind of being able to get dressed. Um, work or study, education, and of course, leisure activities as well. So there's a massive spectrum of things um, that we consider as occupations um, and that we help people to be able to do. Um, so this is the definition um, that the uh, Royal College of Occupational Therapists, so that's our governing body, um, and they say that occupational therapy provides practical support. So I think that word practical is really key to, to who we are and what we do to enable people to facilitate recovery and overcome any barriers that prevent them from doing the activities, the occupations that matter to them. This helps to increase people's independence and satisfaction in all aspects of life. So, yeah, like I said, I think the key words in there is about, you know, this being quite practical. We I think we are quite practical um, people as, um, as occupational therapists. Um, and it is about helping people overcome any barriers. Um, so whether somebody's had an injury or an illness um, or they've got a long term condition, um, it, you know, it doesn't really matter what the root cause um, of somebody's difficulties is. But it's about, you know, us trying to find, trying to get over those barriers and help them to become a bit more independent um, with what they want to be able to do. 
Um, we very much take a whole person approach. Um, so that's to kind of meaning we encompass both mental and physical health and well-being um, in order to help people achieve their full potential. So again, I think that's a really nice thing about um, occupational therapy or OT, as we abbreviated to, um, is that we, you know, teach, you know, all of the students um, and that we're all trained to look at, you know, mental health and physical health. Um, and we're, you know, what we, we use is we're kind of holistic, this kind of whole person approach um, when we're working with our clients. Um, so, yeah, like I said, it is a very person centred health profession. Um, we really kind of try and build relationships with the um, people that we're working with and find out what's important to them um, in, in our work. Um, we're very concerned with promoting health and well-being through the use of occupation. So that's a really kind of the, the core of, of what OT is, um, is that we think about how we can use occupations um, to help um, to promote kind of the health and well-being of the people that we work with. We enable people to participate in activities of everyday life. Um, and we work with you know, people sort of on an individual level, but also on a community level as well. Um, this is a nice quote that we, we often use, and it just says that occupational therapy practitioners ask what matters to you and not what's the matter with you. So again, that's really core to, to what we do. And we're maybe less focused on what is actually wrong with people, you know, what illness have they got, what injury have they got? That's, you know, it is important, but it's less of what we focus on. We really focus on actually, um, you know, what's that stopping you from being able to do? And what would you like to be able to do that you can't do now? Um, so it, you know, we really want it to be a career for everyone. Um, you know, there's a huge range of people that need support from occupational therapists. We work with people, you know, really across the lifespan from, you know, small babies, um, in, you know, neonatal units, um, all the way through the lifespan with people in, um, elderly care and then, you know, to end of life care as well. And we really want to, you know, therefore kind of attract people from kind of all walks of life to the profession as well um, so that the profession as a whole really reflects um, the people in the communities that we're working with. Um, so when might someone need an occupational therapist? So I'm assuming, you know, the reason some of you are most of you are here is because you'll have heard um, of OT. And often we find that people who come into OT um, to study have um, encountered an OT at some point um, or perhaps have, um, you know, have worked with an OT or, you know, family member have had an OT. Um, so it can be really anything. Um, so it is really, like I said, when there are problems with everyday routines or people are struggling with some of those occupations that they want or need to be able to do in their day. Um, and it might be related to an illness, to a disability, either a new disability or a long term disability and um, getting older. So as we get older, things get a little bit more difficult sometimes. Um, a change, perhaps, in personal living circumstances um, or barriers that have, have come up for that person um, and a lack of opportunities um, in their environment. So there's a really kind of really wide range um, of things that we work with and environments that we work in and areas that we work in. So that's the next slide. Yeah. Um, so we, we work in so many different areas. So hospitals um, is a kind of, yeah, very kind of popular area that we work in. So we do work in acute hospitals with people that are sick or have experienced injury. Um, and that could be a physical hospital, but also mental health hospitals as well. So people who are um, experiencing um, acute mental health um, difficulties or perhaps in a rehab setting. Um, we work in social services, so local authority. Um, we kind of in those um, environments focus a lot on housing and um, perhaps making adaptations to people's housing um, if they need it, um, issuing equipment, so adaptive equipment to people who need it. Schools and nurseries, we play a really big role um, in paediatrics. So you'll often find OTs um, in based in schools and nurseries and other um, kind of paediatric services. Um, charities and um, so the photo there is of a, a pets as therapy charity um, but we we now work and this is kind of I guess coming um, a little bit more common and we're broadening our roles out into the third sector um, and finding that actually lots of charities now are employing OTs um, to work there 
um, private practice. Um, so a bit kind of maybe further down your careers, people do end up working a little bit more now in private practice. There's definitely some scope for that. Um, and prisons, um, that's again, quite a new area, definitely an area where we have a really big role, but it's still, I guess, what we call emerging um, as a role for OT. Um, and that's just, you know, a really small snapshot um, of, of the places that we work. There's, there's lots, lots more areas um, that we work in. Um, so, like I said, we work with people of all ages, backgrounds, circumstances, um, and then we might work uh, on a slightly larger level as well. So with commissioners, um, with communities, groups, and then, of course, on an individual level um, as well. Um, and locally, nationally, so thinking about, you know, things on a more national level and, of course, internationally as well. Um, OT is quite well recognised internationally, so <laughs> you will find um, that, yeah, there's lots of different networks um, abroad of OTs who, who work abroad as well. Um, and you can get involved with that a little bit further down the line. Um, so what do we actually do? So we really focus on identifying kind of skills and strengths and abilities and interests that are important to the person. So we're not, you know, we try not to look at the things people can do, but actually what can they do? Um, and more, more importantly, what do they what do they want to be able to do? Um, so we always ask about somebody's roles and their routines. So what do they normally do? Um, and like I said earlier, what they're expected to perform. So, we, you know, we do have things that we are expected to do, don't we? Um, we do some assessment um, and identify what needs the person might have. We set goals. That's a big part of what we do. So asking the person what their goals are, what they want to work on um, and then plan our treatment. And so what are we then going to do about it? Um, and there's a range of interventions um, that we use. So that very much depends on the setting that you're working with and the age group that you're working with. And um, there's lots and lots of different things um, that we have in our in our toolbox to help people um, to get back to and to be able to participate in their occupations. Um, so why become an OT? Um, so it's really, really rewarding um, as a career. So we really do help people um, to engage in, in the things that are most meaningful to them. Um, we're quite unique in that we're the only profession that specifically uses occupation and those occupations that is, are important to people as our therapeutic tool. So that's what we're using um, to, to do our jobs. Um, like I said, we work across a diverse range of settings. So if you, you know, end up working in a certain area and you think actually this isn't for me, I'd like to try something else, you can usually quite easily switch. Um, so that's really nice. Um, you never really get bored. Um, we have a really kind of complex understanding of the importance of occupations on people's health, well-being, and quality of life. Um, and you'll nearly always be able to get a job. Um, there's, you know, as you might have heard, a kind of nationwide shortage of all career, of all healthcare jobs at the moment. And, and OT is, is on that list of jobs um, that is that people people do want. Um, so, yeah, you you will always be able to get a job, certainly at the moment. Um, so a little bit about St George's. Let me just quickly check the time. Yeah, we're fine. Um, so why come and study at St George's? Um, so St George's is, um, so it's nice city St George's. It will be officially city St George's um, from March. Um, so we have merged with city, um, but we will remain as the Tooting campus. Um, and we are, I guess, the only um, kind of specialist health university um, in the UK. So everything at um, the teaching campus is, is all healthcare, it's all medical. Um, we are sited on um, the same site of, as a large teaching hospital. So you might have visited for open days already. Um, but if not, you'll see when you kind of immediately walk in um, to St. George's that it is on the exact same site as St. George's Hospital. So you're kind of waiting for your coffee um, with kind of healthcare professionals that work in the hospital as well. Um, so you get to really kind of be in that environment and absorb um, that environment. Um, we are quite proud that we have a really high proportion of students that graduate with good degrees. I think last year it was in the high 80s. I can't quite remember the exact figure now. Um, so that students that either graduate with a first or a 2-1. Um, and, you know, grades aren't everything um, with this profession, but that is something that we are quite proud of. Um, 
and like I said, you know, jobs at the moment are plentiful. So um, kind of last year, uh, 93% um, of our students were in work or further study. So whatever they they kind of wanted to be able to do, if they wanted to go and do a master's or if they wanted um, to be employed, 93% um, of people um, were kind of where they wanted to be within 15, minutes, 15 months of finishing the course. Um, and the NSS is the National Student Survey. Um, so this is a survey that all students um, across the country in every course, every university gets sent um, after graduation um, or at the end of the course um, to fill in a survey um, about their satisfaction of the course that they've just finished. Um, and we always get really high scores, um, both kind of nationally against kind of other courses, but also um, we are we always score really highly um, in the university as well um, compared to some of the other courses. So we're quite proud of that. Um, so some of the, I suppose, benefits um, of St. George's maybe in comparison to other um, occupational therapy programmes, we have a quite a small student cohort. So the maximum um, students that we will have is 30. Um, we're, that's probably not going to change um, in the foreseeable. So there'll be about about 30 students. Um, we're very diverse. We're kind of situated in London and in South London. Um, so we do attract um, a real diversity of students. And, you know, that's not just about kind of race and ethnic background, but age groups as well. Um, we kind of often have quite a wide um, range of ages, um, still quite a lot of um, females compared to males, um, but that is getting a little bit better. Um, but yeah, there's always a really nice diversity in our cohorts. Um, we've got a growing team at the moment um, of experienced teaching staff and clinicians and researchers. So we've all worked clinically and before, and we all come from different clinical backgrounds. So we bring that experience into the classroom. Um, we have specially um, designed teaching rooms for the OT course. We call it the Art of Living Suite. Um, so we've got a simulated kitchen and bathroom um, and kind of designated equipment and things like that that we can use for teaching. Um, there is lots of kind of on a wider university level, really nice library, lots of study space, computer rooms, access to lots of journals and books. Um, we also really lucky because of kind of where we are with the on um, the same site as St. George's Hospital. And um, we have access to what we call an anatomy suite. Um, so this used to be a dissection lab. It's not used for that anymore, but it is purely used for teaching. Um, so that's that's really great. And you will get access to that in your first year for teaching teaching. Um, so our program is um, accredited by the Health and Care Professions Council, so they have to approve all the courses um, for OT in the country, as do the Royal College of OT. We're also accredited by the Royal Federation of OT, so that means it is a little bit easier if you wanted to go and work in another country that we are recognised and approved by the Royal Federation. Um, at the end of the three years of the BSc programme, you're completely qualified to practice. So there's no extra kind of learning or anything that needs to happen at the end. You, you are ready to go. And we include a thousand hours of practice experience um, in our programme, and that's what's required. So the Royal College of OT require that you have a thousand hours um, of kind of being out on practice placement um, for in order for you to qualify. And these are some of our students and um, some photos that we took a few years ago of various activities that were going on. Um, so what does the course look like? So it's a three year full time programme um, split across three terms. So September to Christmas, Christmas to Easter and Easter to summer. Um, there's approximately 16 to 20 hours of teaching per week. So I know you're probably thinking that doesn't look like full time, um, but we do expect you to do additional work outside of that face to face um, study kind of learning time. Um, so you might, it depends on kind of what term it's in and what year you're in. You might be in three days a week, but actually we'll give you probably at least a day or a day and a half um, worth of other work that you'll you'll need to do. And we use a combination of lectures. They're not loads of big lectures because obviously, like I said, we're quite a small, small cohort. Um, more kind of classroom based learning, small group work, a um, little bit using technology and virtual learning environments. And like I said, there's 28 weeks, which equates to that thousand hours of practice placement over the three years. 
Um, so this won't mean too much to you now, but just a little bit of an overview of what the course actually does look like. Um, so in your first year, there's four modules. The ones that are colour green um, are ones that um, what we call interprofessional. So you do those with other students from other courses. Um, so Essentials for Allied Health is done jointly with physiotherapy and diagnostic radiography and factors influencing professional practice is just us and the physiotherapy students. And then the two in the middle in that nice beige colour um, are just occupational therapy modules. And then at the very end of first year, you get to go on your first placement and that's only four weeks. And then in second year, it's just us. So all the modules are ju done just, um, just with the occupational therapy students. There's no interprofessional learning. Um, and then you could do one nine week placement. Um, and then in third year, you've got three modules um, and two placements. So third year is a little bit heavy um, on the placement. So there's two eight week placements that happen in year three. Um, so some examples, because we often get lots of questions about placement um, and where people might go. Um, so this is, again, a bit like where we work is just a really small snapshot. Um, so palliative care is an example, children's services, um, eating disorders, maybe community learning disability teams, um, acute trust. So when we say acute trust, we usually mean um, big hospitals, so physical hospitals mental health. Um, there is an opportunity um, in your final year to go on an international placement. Um, and then what we call role emerging placements. So this would be like what I was saying about prisons so some, and maybe um, some third sector placements. So with charities, um, placements that are kind of establishing um, new OT services and would like students to, to come on board. Um, so that's quite exciting. Um, and it's just worth noting that you will you will have to travel to placements. So that's always something we want to make sure that we make quite clear from the beginning um, is that, you know, we do get offered placements all over London and London's really quite big. Um, so just to be aware that you will have to, you know, travel, you might have to travel to and from placement. Um, and then at St George's, there's lots and lots of support for students. Um, so there's a free counselling service, which is, you know, excellent. That doesn't happen everywhere. Um, of course, the programme team, so us. Um, and there's a thing called Study Plus, which is um, a kind of library service that helps you with your academic skills. Um, so if it's your first time um, coming to university and you're not kind of sure how to write in a kind of un at university level or in an academic way, they'll be able to help you with that. Everyone gets allocated a personal tutor. Um, so that's kind of your point of contact in the course team. Um, there is a really good student life centre. Um, of course, your peers, so other um, people in your class. Um, we do have an excellent disability team. So, you know, we very much welcome, um, you know, applications. If you've um, got any, you know, disabilities, uh, learning difficulties, dyslexia, um, mental health diagnoses, anything, um, you know, we will see what we can do and we'll make sure that we um, can support you as best as we can. Um, and there's, you know, lots of welfare support as well. We've got a really active student union. Um, and lots of other services within, within the student union um, that are there to support you as well. Um, so very quickly, um, a little bit about the entry requirements. So the kind of first thing that you need to do is think about the academic requirements. Um, so a GCSE level um, or equivalent, if you're, you know, didn't do that level of education in this country, um, we're looking for maths, um, and English and a science at grade four or a C. Um, at A level, um, it's BBB. Um, and then we do, of course, um, accept people through other routes, such as access courses. If you've done a previous degree as well, um, a foundation degree, BTEC, um, please do have a look at the website. There's a bit more detailed information on there about those um, other access routes um, into the course. Um, and you can always contact our admissions team as well. Um, and if you have any queries and they'll be able to, to give you a bit more kind of specific bespoke um, advice about that. So once you have looked at the academic uh, requirements and the non-academic um, things, so we ask you then, of course, to apply through UCAS and you've got to write your personal statement and show that you have, you know, commitment to studying occupational therapy um, and understanding of kind of what we do and the scope of practice. 
Um, we'd always recommend you look at what the um, NHS health and social care values are at the moment, because we often ask about those. Um, and then once you get through that step, then the final step is that we'll invite you to interview. And what we do here and lots of other universities do the same is called a multiple mini interview, so an MMI. Um, and that's where you go around, um, I think there's five stations, um, and you get asked a different question. And they're not about occupational therapy because we don't expect you to know anything about that right now, but they're based on those key values. So things around dignity, respect, team working, um, and things like that. So, but you'll, you know, once you get to that point, we'll give you lots more information about that. Um, and then once you get through that and you get an offer, um, you will be um, asked to do um, a police check, um, so a DBS, um, and also a health check. So that's we have to make sure that all of our students, um, that's you know this applies to everyone who works in healthcare, um, you know have of course no criminal background, but are also well and healthy enough to to be here and to take part in the course. Um, and that is it. Um, so those are the contact details for our admissions tutor. Um, so Sarah, she wasn't able to be here today, and Caitlin, who is, is with us. Um, so it might be worth taking note of those, oh, sorry, those email addresses um, if you want to ask any more questions um, about the course. And like I said, you can always contact our admissions team as well. So those are some references. That is me. Um, hiya, so I um, briefly introduced myself earlier to those who are there, um, but my name is Lizzie and I am a second year student here currently um, on the Occupational Therapy Programme. Um, so I am just here to tell you a bit about my experience of being a student here so far. Um, so I'm a mature student, um, which I couldn't quite believe. Um, I had done a degree in psychology um, prior to coming here and then had been working as a course administrator at an educational college for about six years. Um, I actually didn't know what occupational therapy was until about a couple of years before applying. Um, I had always loved helping and encouraging people, um, but hadn't really started considering um, a healthcare profession um, until I actually saw a video online of a 17-year-old girl who had had um, a cheerleading accident and was paralysed um, and just seeing how her life changed so dramatically. She was once so um, independent and athletic and then suddenly was dependent on um, her family and friends for everything. Um, I just found watching her journey really inspirational and seeing how important it was to her for her to find adapted ways of doing activities um, such as she loves to do her own makeup. So seeing how she was able to go about that um, and how occupational therapists can really provide that practical support. Um, that was what really made me consider that this was actually something I'd really love to do, um, particularly when they've got barriers that they're facing in any kind. Um, as a mature student, I was a bit nervous that I might be the oldest on the course. Um, I'm 28, um, but that's not been the case. And it's been really lovely to have, as Rachel said, such a wide range of ages on the course. So we had um, some school leavers, so some coming in at 18 or 19. Um, but there's also a number of us who've come in from perhaps doing another career or working as an OT assistant um, or having done a previous degree um, as well. Um, and I was actually already living in southwest London beforehand because of my work. So I um, have stayed living with a couple of friends um, there. So it takes me about 45 minutes commute to George's, um, which is still less than it did for work. So that's always a bonus. Um, but one thing you'll find about studying at George's compared to my first degree, where it was very much campus based uni, um, is a lot of people will commute. Um, so I would say the majority in my year group do commute across um, a whole air, wide area in London. Um, but there's also the opportunities to live in halls if that is something that um, would suit you. Perhaps you're not based in London or um, you just want to have that sort of student community. Um, I've had friends in that and they've really loved that too. Um, one of the things I'd love to say is 
I really liked St George's because it was a specialist healthcare university when I was looking at it against other courses. Um, this may have been silly, but it made me feel like they knew what they were doing. Um, and the fact that you're surrounded by people who are actually in the profession doing the job right now um, just felt like a really cool experience. Um, and as Rachel said earlier, having the opportunity to have lectures with other healthcare professional students like physios and diagnostic radiographers, um, I think it's just a really helpful tool preparing us for our um, work in the future. Um, something as well that George's I found was really helpful with was when I was thinking of applying or was in the stages of applying. Um, I had some really um, great chats with some of the people in the department to sort of find out more about the course. Um, and there was also um, a system called UniBuddy online where I was able to speak with a current student on the programme to ask any um, questions um, that I had. Um, Rachel also mentioned about there being placements in the course. Um, so I'm just in my second year at the moment, so I've only had the one four week placement. Um, but I would just say it's such a valuable experience. Um, OT and the way we can be involved in so many areas is amazing. And just being able to have a glimpse of what it looks like being an occupational therapist in different settings. Um, it just really helps you to see how you can put the theory that you learn at uni into practice. Um, and actually some of the second module year modules that I'm doing now are looking at sort of the different settings that occupational therapists can work in on like stroke units or helping children with um, learning disabilities um, and across the lifespan um, of the human life. Um, so it's really fascinating and um, great opportunity to be involved in such a variety of um, settings. Um, and yeah, Rachel mentioned this earlier too, but I've really enjoyed having a smaller cohort. Um, my psychology degree, I think there were 200 of us in a year group, so there was no way that I was going to get to know everyone on the course. Um, but having, I think we've got 25, um, it's great to get to know them, know their names, um, hear a bit about their lives and just share the student experience um, together. Um, and then finally, I'll stop waffling soon, I promise. Um, finally, I just thought I'd share a couple of tips if um, they're helpful to anyone and they're things that I found helpful in my time of applying. Um, so the course is great and so is studying, um, but it's important as well to have some time where you're enjoying other things that you like to do. Maybe that's meeting up with friends or if you're staying on campus and um, you might be getting to know new friends or doing various sports or clubs. Um, I would just say allow yourself time to enjoy those things. I try and treat the course a bit like a nine till five, like I did with my last job. Um, so I'm trying not to study in the weekends and on the evenings and just keep my study to during the day. Um, and that has really helped me have a bit more of a like work-life balance. Um, and I would just say come to the course um, with an open mind. Uh, if you're considering applying for the course, you may already know that you want to be a paediatric occupational therapist. And that may well be what you end up doing. But be prepared to be excited by something else. Um, I really didn't think I'd like working in a hospital, but my placement was in a hospital and I actually really loved it. So I would just say come with an open mind um, to be surprised by what you might find interesting. Um, that was a lot of information, but feel free in the Q&A later to ask me some questions. But otherwise, I'll hand over to Gregoria to share her experience too. Thanks, everyone. Um, hi, everyone again. Uh, I'll share some slides with you too, um, which I've prepared. Um, hopefully everyone can see what I'm sharing. Um, so hi everyone again, I'm Gregoria and I have just recently completed my degree this past summer. Um, uh, the BSc obviously in occupational therapy. Um, so why I picked this course? So um, I was interested in uh, healthcare in general. Um, uh, like as a child as well, I actually was a school leaver to um, to do this degree. Um, so it was my first degree and um, I was interested in healthcare and medicine, but I always had my doubts about medicine. 
so becoming a do doctor. And when I heard about occupational therapy, I thought um, it sounded really amazing. I didn't really have the opportunity to actually know and like shadow to see what it actually is, because I was I'm also an international student, so I grew up in Cyprus. Um, but it sounded really nice, and the people I spoke to, and like the university tutors as well, which I had the chance to talk to, um, really inspired me. And I thought I'd take the risk. Why not? So I went for it, and I've not doubted once uh, my decision to uh, following this career. Um, and I'm currently now doing a master's actually in neuro rehabilitation, um, which yeah, I'm enjoying at the moment. So, um, as the others have mentioned before as well, um, St George's is uh, the UK's specialist health university, which is um, something very unique. Um, our campus at the moment is the hospital, at St George's Hospital, um, and so for example, when I would go to uni, I would walk through the hospital to get to the lecture rooms and to the uni part of St George's which was very um, unique and very cool um, we're also small cohorts which is something that I really enjoyed too as Lizzie said before um, it's really nice to get to know everyone and also um, create a good relationship with your tutors as well um, mm -hmm. being able to ask them and so like feeling confident to go and find them because you know them a bit better um, it was really helpful for me throughout the course. Um, we also got a really good library, which is very useful and very good as you'd need um, good resources for your um, assignments and in general, like a nice place to study as well. They've also got um, nice rooms that you can rent. You can book uh, in advance to do like group work as well and there's like silent study spaces there's um quiet study spaces so it's yeah just really convenient and nice um there's also a canteen on campus uh, and shops as well um and as rachel mentioned as well we'll usually go to uni like three to four times a week and also have self-directed um work throughout the week um, so yeah Really, yeah, really good. Um, in terms of societies and activities at St George's, so we automatically qualify for student union membership once you're a student there. Um, there's an occupational therapy society, which I, I was part, part of. It restarted last year, so hopefully it's still going on and hopefully will thrive as well. Um, there's an SU bar, student union bar, which um, host social events, but you could also go there to um, just have your lunch there with your friends. Um, there's also a games room, a cafe, dance studio, music room, and several counselling and welfare rooms as well. Um, in terms of societies, there's sports clubs, there's musical, drama and comedy, and other various societies, which I would, yeah, just really um, recommend you'd try them if you're choosing to be a student at St George's um, as it's yeah a, just a nice opportunity to meet more people and do activities that you're interested in um, and not just uni work. Um, there's a lot of places to go out to as well like um, I remember we would we were used to um, go out for lunch sometimes when we had like an hour break we'll go to a restaurant nearby or we would go to a pub in the afternoon like at the end of the uh, semester with like the whole uni cohort cohort because it's quite easy because it's quite small one obviously um so yeah there's pubs there's a gym as well nearby if you're staying at the campus or near the uh, different shops Sainsbury's etc um a tip would be uh, for you to um, make sure you are taking care of your well-being as obviously you are a student and you want to th thrive in that um, area and study but it's also very important to be well your own selves and do your extracurriculars and extra activities um, so you're well to study and support others as well.
Um, I'd really recommend socialising and meeting unique individuals as it's a great opportunity at St George's. Um, I'd say try and have confidence. I know it might be difficult, especially at the start, uh, but it's worth giving it a try. Um, it's really important to do networking and create good relationships with people. And it's an opportunity as well as you're um, quite close to your tutors and um, the other students. And it's also really nice that London is very diverse. Um, so there's very unique people out there. And yeah, as uh, Lizzie mentioned before, like mature students, school leavers, there's um, different like international students as well. So it's really nice to hear where they've come from and their experience in life and why they're choosing to do OT and where they're going as well. Um, so um, you could either um, stay at student halls, um, which I heard is a really lovely opportunity um, and a great experience. Um, it's nice as a student, like for me, it was the first time I moved out of home. So it was really, um, really nice to get to manage independently and live student life, university student life. Um, so teaching Broadway would be a home away from home. Um, and personally, what I did for the three years of the course, I uh, commuted. So I stayed with um, friends and relatives outside um, in London, but not in Tooting. Um, but it was like a really easy commute. Um, there's uh, the Tooting Broadway station. I think it's around a 10 minute walk, maybe a bit less as well uh, from the train station. So yeah, uni is um, really close to the train station. It's on the Northern line as well. Um, and placements in general, um, can vary where they are, but um, I think, I believe, uh, London transportation is quite easy to learn and quite easy to go with, so I didn't really have any difficulties like getting there on time. But yeah, it's quite important to have good time management and being organised in general to make sure that you're there um, on time. Um, so living in London, I'll say there's endless things to do and discover, which I really enjoyed. Um, a lot of food, a lot of parks, musicals, theatre and more. Um, and it's really great, like for me as well, I, I had the opportunity to travel a lot from London, which I really enjoyed. So again, I'll say it's really good to do things that you enjoy and um, have the opportunity to do as a student. Um, which you wouldn't have the opportunity otherwise. So um, yeah, that was really a good experience for me. Another tip is taking care of yourself. So I'd say um, self-compassion is very important. So um, my father says the saying, which is self-care with no guilt. So taking care of yourself, obviously, is very important to, to then be able to do what you have to do in your daily routine and support other students, support um, um, and be an occupational therapist and be a student. So yeah, really important. Um, also, there is a lot of support for the students, as Rachel previously mentioned, um, during induction week, I think they'll usually tell you about what support is available. Um, and also you've got your personal tutor, which it was like, for my experience as well, I'll go there and um, like send an email to my personal student, tell them, can we please meet because of this? And then we'll have like a quick meeting and yeah, have things sorted. Um, I'll say setting boundaries when needed and getting personal support, support is really important. Um, so you can have a balance to juggle both university and like your life in general. So what I really enjoyed um so placement was really nice and yeah teaching sessions and like doing group projects with all my peers was really nice um getting to know the university professors quite well making lifelong friendships so i've finished uni this past august but i'm still in touch with my friends and um planning to meet so um yeah just meeting very unique people 
and yeah just being a university student is something to enjoy so yeah thank you very much thank you for listening and if you've got any questions um please ask Thank you so much to Gregoria and Lizzie. It's always really nice hearing our students' perspective as well. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Um, we've I've seen there's been some questions um, popping up and Caitlin's been answering most of them, I think, as we've gone along. Um, there was a couple there at the end that we didn't quite get to. Um, I liked the one about, you know, trying to choose between occupational therapy and physiotherapy. Um, that's, I think you're probably not on your own there. Um, I think, you know, obviously, like Caitlin said, we're, of course, very, very biased um, to OT on this call. Um, but something else that you might want to do is go and get some experience. Um, so think about getting some work experience in both areas, um, reaching out to local hospitals, because lots of kind of big hospitals will have that um structure in place where they offer work experience opportunities and that might give you a little bit of a, a better idea of of kind of where where your interests lie um, and then some questions about international placements um, that I thought I would answer um, so Gregory I know you considered it didn't you in your final year so how it works is that we offer it just for the final placement so it's your kind of fourth placement right sort of towards the end of, of your final year um, there are some criteria that you have to meet um, in order to apply and be accepted for an international placement um, and that's things around grades so we want sort of to I suppose students who we know are going to cope um, with being on an international placement, um, so both academically and I suppose personally as well. Um, so we do look at attendance grades um, and we get you to write a statement explaining, you know, why you think that you would be a good candidate to go in an international placement. Because um, obviously what we don't want is for students to be somewhere far, far away and for them not to be managing very well. And we're not there, you know, we're not able to go there. Um, whereas, you know, students are struggling for any reason on placement um, in London we can very easily go and visit if we need to um, or meet with the student in person and it's it's all a lot easier um, so that's the kind of process so we have just started offering international placements just before Covid and then it all stopped for a little while um, so we, it's only been back up and running for the last two years so we had one student um, two years ago so the year before you Gregoria who went to South Africa um, and then last year, one of our students went to Bangladesh. Um, and I know one of our students this year is um, has asked and is, is very seriously considering going to that same placement in Bangladesh. Um, so you need to find the placement yourself um, and you do need to self-fund it. But there are some funding opportunities available um, to support you with that at the university. Um, so is it competitive to get international placements? So yeah, hopefully I've answered that question um, and the example. So it's it's again, it's quite new. This course only started in 2017. Um, so and we had just kind of got to the point where we were able to offer international placements when COVID happened. Um, so are there sports occupational therapists? Um, not really. I suppose that's not specifically um, a role that we work in. Um, you know, sports is an occupation. It might be something that people come and ask us about. You know, that might be someone's goal would be to get back to doing sports, but it's not a particular area um, or a kind of specific area that we would work in, no. Any other questions? Anyone want to ask Lizzie or Gregory anything that they haven't already covered? No. Well, I saw someone typing. Come again.
a good question. Who wants to go? <laughs> Um, I'm happy to chat a bit about one of mine. Um, so I thought that the anatomy and that side of things would be quite tough. Um, I was actually almost in a, well, I probably wasn't as far along as you, but I was wondering about physiotherapy um, and occupational therapy and actually um, decided to go down the occupational therapy route. And I'm very glad, but again, I'm a bit biased now <laughs> I'm on the course, but I knew that I always struggled a bit with like learning biological anatomy and terms like that and you do still need to know that for occupational therapy and we do have a module on that in first year but physios will need to learn quite a bit more and um, but I was still quite nervous um so I would just give advice on um just give yourself time um if you can look over the lecture notes for the anatomy slides before the session just so you've got a vague idea what's happening um like Gregoria said don't be afraid to ask questions everyone really wants to help you with your learning and it's a great way to sort of consolidate what you've been learning and check if you've understood it yourself um, and as Rachel said, there's really helpful anatomy practical sessions so you can kind of see it in practice. Um, so if you're more of a visual learner, there are also like videos available as well. So I would just yeah, give yourself time um, if that's something you're nervous about. Um, and there's a lot of support available if that is something you struggle with. But I would say that was mine. Um, for me, I'll say I was a bit um scared maybe about the transition of being like a student in, in a secondary school and then transitioning to um, university um, but as we all said like there's a lot of support and um, I didn't once feel um, like it was uh, whenever I needed support about like assignments as well or had questions about them which sometimes were quite challenging um, there's like the student life center and um various like um online tools but also people you could speak to to uh guide you with your assignments if you're having difficulty with that um so yeah even though it was quite scary at the start because it was a big change for me um uh, it all um went quite smoothly so um there is it's just you being able to and um, feeling confident to ask, send emails, go to your tutors, tell them if, some, if something's challenging you. Um, and even like during placement as well, if you've had challenges or have challenges during placement, um, you could always contact your personal tutor um, and tell them, you know, I'm struggling. How should we deal with this? Tell them what's going on um, and they would always support you. So there isn't, I think, a challenge that you'd feel that it's too hard to overcome so yeah thank you guys um well, we've had one are there any books that you would recommend as a good introduction to the world of ot there's lots of books guys i don't know if there's any one book that you kind of have felt was a good overview or a good starting point I am not sure I could think of a book off the top of my head, but um, I would say to check out the Royal College of Occupational Therapy website. Um, they sort of have some really helpful pages which just break down what occupational therapists do um, and what kind of areas they can be in. And I think they have some day in the life videos of what an OT um, might be involved in. So that's what I looked up um, before I came. Yeah, they do. That's a really good recommendation. And the other thing I've just thought of actually rather than kind of going down the route of sort of big expensive books um, is there's some podcasts. Um, so the OT and Chill podcast is really good. Again, lots of different kind of podcasts about different experiences of people working in different clinical areas, different parts of the world, things like that. So that might give you a good snapshot and be a little bit more accessible um, than some of the, the big old heavy textbooks that we have. Um, and then what are your best moments in occupational therapy? Gregoria, you're a bit further down the line. Do you want to start with that one? Yeah. Um, so best moments. I'd say like um, 
placements were a big thing for me um so in general like getting to see your profession in practice so what you're going to be doing is really huge and um yeah i i believe occupational therapy is quite amazing in like what occupational therapists can do and how they can influence the life of a person um ot's out there are really inspiring as well um and yeah, just having that contact with patients and getting to see them improve, getting to see them go home if that's what they're aiming to do or get to do activities that they couldn't do. Yeah, it could be emotional, but it's all worth it. And yeah, just really unique. So um, I think that's my peak. <laughs> my peak experiences will, yeah, placement experiences. Three minutes left. Did you have a highlight so far, Lizzie? Um, I would probably say placement as well, to be honest. Um, like Gregoria said, just putting it into practice and seeing what it looks like. Um, and like the nature of many health conditions that we might be helping people with, they're not necessarily gonna get better. And that can be quite sad and hard to be around, but actually we're here to help try and make their life as best as we can um at this point in time and so to be able to see like the rewards of helping this person to be able to do that um it's just so joyful and they're then no patient well i only did a four week patient but patients are very appreciative because they know that you're trying to support them um and well like gregoria said whether that's getting them home or just making their life a bit more enjoyable um whilst they're here so um so yeah i would say placement is a big one Great. Thank you, guys. Um, we are almost out of time and I don't see any more questions. So unless anyone has any final burning questions that they want to ask, I might draw it to a close on those lovely positive notes um, from you two. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much to all of everyone um, for attending this evening. We really hope that you have found this useful. Um, and thank you so much um, to Gregory and Lizzie, because I know that um, your insights and your um, views on your experiences here at St. George's are really what is valuable um, to our kind of prospective students. So thank you so much um, for giving up your time this evening. Um, and I hope everyone did find that useful. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.